All right, chapter seven from Birth and Death of the Sun. There are some things that we don't think is the case now, and a lot of that's because of the technology, the observational tools, things like infrared telescopes that we have to make more accurate observations. We also have new estimates of the age of the Earth. We know that the Earth is, or we think it is, about 4.46 billion years old. So we think the sun must be about the same age. And Gamov's day, or when Birth and Death of the Sun was originally written, the age of the Earth was thought more to be about 2 billion years old. So there have been adjustments over time. And those all correspond to sort of fine tuning our understanding of stars. Another thing that astronomers thought was that red giants were the beginning stages of stars, and that is actually not, not the case. Um, the other part, the CNO cycle, does not occur inside red giants. It is too cool. This is also not necessarily the case uh, so much now, but we have a, a different explanation for this. Inside red giants, we aren't looking at any hydrogen to helium fusion. We are really looking at triple alpha process. Red giants, especially the kind our sun will become, are fusing helium into bigger elements. The section reactions of light elements, three types of fusion reactions. This gets to why we're pretty sure that lithium and beryllium aren't the source of any kind of uh, solar fusion. Hydrogen and deuterium forming helium, this also forms energy. Boron fusing to form carbon or helium, that also forms energy as well. But the lithium and the beryllium, when you fuse those to form helium and other stuff, you do not create energy. So this is, this is a, a good indicator of what would be a possible fusion reaction to power our sun, the one that produces the most energy based on the stuff that we think is there. So the light elements, uh, we're pretty sure hydrogen and deuterium are what are being fused together in our sun. The absence of the lightest elements in the sun, again, this section, there is no lithium, beryllium, or boron in the sun's core. Helium, hydrogen is becoming helium, and then helium is building up, and eventually when the helium builds up, the triple alpha process will take over. Reactions of the light elements in the red giants, ignore this section. All right, pulsating stars. We learned a lot about stars that change brightness last semester. Remember there were the eclipsing binaries, and we looked at things called light curves. So the magnitude of the star, uh, the time axis, and this would be the apparent magnitude because we are observing this. If we had an eclipsing binary, you'd have a little dip and then a big dip corresponding when the two stars went in front of each other, assuming they were different sizes and brightnesses, but they're not pulsating binaries. A star that varies, again I'll write apparent magnitude, and time, in this way a big spike and increase and then a dip and then a spike and increase and then a dip and then a spike and increase and then a dip regularly is literally changing size. And it's interesting that only red and orange giants are observed to pulsate. This tells us something about the types of stars that, or something about the reactions going on inside the stars and what's causing the pulsation. So I said, when the helium gets used up, the triple alpha process takes over, but that doesn't immediately kick in. There will be a point in our sun's future where there is a bunch of hydrogen still left over, but there's a lot of helium too. And then when the helium starts to fuse aside or alongside the hydrogen fusing, you'll produce more energy raising temperatures, but then what happens is it pushes the star outwards. So you will have a situation where hydrogen is going into helium, and then maybe helium starts going into carbon, a bunch of, it takes three heliums to do that. And this is the core, these are the outer layers. As that, as that takes place, maybe the star's size puffs out. And then as it puffs out, temperatures really drop inside the star and the helium to carbon stops.
So this puff out then proceeds to a return to the original size, like that hydrogen to helium. And then the helium to carbon starts again. And so the cycle just repeats itself. So we get this situation where the sun starts, or the star will start changing its mode of fusion. I want you to review Cosmos section 11.7 for this. The figure 41 is a really good example of this. Heavier and brighter stars will have, and these are in the absolute magnitude sense. We'll have longer pulsation periods because they're just larger stars. And so the, the distance that the star actually has to puff out and expand and then shrink back down is bigger. So it just takes longer. Smaller stars can pulsate, can puff out and shrink down a lot faster. So your short period, the RR Leary type, again look at the Cosmos figure 12-19 for this, those are your short period, they have uh, days, your normal period, the word normal came from the fact this is one of the first variable stars really studied, uh, their periods can be anywhere from days to years, and then the long period, the Mira uh, variable stars can take years. And these aren't the only types of pulsating stars. There are irregularly pulsating stars. There are um, combinations where we see like two different modes of pulsation going on. There's a whole bunch of ways a star can pulsate and that's what makes variable stars so fascinating. These are just three main groups that we classify when we're considering types of fusion changes going on inside of a star. The cause of pulsation, again, are a result of imbalances between gravitational attraction and the nuclear reaction pressure. So other resources for learning about pulsating stars, the AAVSO, that's the American Association of Variable Star Observers. They have wonderful pages and descriptions of what variable stars are, specifically the pulsating variables. Um, and I encourage you to go look at those for just an additional explanation on, on variable stars and the pulsating variables.